Welcome to today's webinar with the title The World of Embedded Components in Printed Circuit Boards, Part 1 Basics. The speaker of today's webinar is Mr. Jürgen Wolf, head of our Advanced Solution Center. And now I wish you lots of fun and new information. Thank you, Andreas, for this kind introduction. And just a few more notes to my person. Um, as head of the newly created Advanced Solution Center, I'm basically responsible for these embedding technologies, which I will show you in the next yeah, 30 to 40 minutes. I'm responsible as well for this new technology of uh, stretchable printed circuit boards. There will be a webinar uh, beginning uh, next year as well so that you can see what we are offering in that technology. And in that function, I'm supporting the sales and uh, the manufacturing um, and plan the further developments of these technologies. For you, as an information, I'm with Wood Electronics since uh, 2008. I started in R&D and moved on then to these additional functions. What do I want to show you today? Well, first, I want to give you an insight into the different variants of the embedding technology. We will then have a look onto the different process flows. And in the third bullet, we will see how you can select between the different embedding variants so that you know what to choose. We will have a look into the design rules. And in the last part of this today's webinar, we will have a look onto the workflow for such a project. We named this part one, the basics. There will be a second part, again, beginning next year, where we want to have in a more detailed look into points like how do I lay out uh, these um, boards with embedded components and what kind of applications do we already do? But uh, we will come to this in the end of the webinar. But before we start uh, to go into the details for the basics, I would like to ask you the following question. Have you ever planned or executed a project with embedded components? So that I know what is the actual knowledge present here in this webinar group. So, okay, so you may give us your answer. Make your decision, please. We have reached more than 60%. And I will wait just another five seconds roundabout. Then we end the poll and show the result. Okay, so let's see the result here. Only 60% have no experience with this technology and already 40% already planned or did projects with embedded components. That's nice. That's especially interesting because I was giving this same webinar um, earlier in the morning in a German version and the German audience was not that experienced. So I had far less uh, people who planned or executed already a project with embedded components. Therefore, it's uh, quite interesting that my international audience is here quite more experienced in the technology. And I hope that I can give you a little bit more insight if you've already known the technology. And for those who are really not familiar yet with it, I hope that you will get a good insight into the technology so that you can start to plan a project. Or even if you do not have a existing project that maybe sometimes in future you will get the idea and see that there is something else which you can use and maybe embedding might be of an option for you in a future project so let's have a look onto the different technologies but before we get into the de technologies in detail and into the process flows uh, there is always the question why would one want to use uh, embedded components. So what are the advantages and benefits um, by doing it? And I would say the worldwide biggest trend or biggest usage in volume is basically the package replacement because this is being done in the smartphone industry for quite some years now. 
Uh, packet replacement means that you take a component or several components and use uh, the printed circuit board processes um, to create your own package. So you can make your own module, your own system in package and use it, for example, um, in an assembly step as well. So if you have more um, applications which basically have the, the same functionalities but uh, different um, outer layer options or maybe always the same basic functionality like a radio module or something like this, then you can create your own module in a basically compared to a packaging process really cheap way because you do not have this um, initial costs like in a packaging where you need the molding forms and stuff like this. The other trend is uh, that you really have sometimes uh, the, the problem that you do not have enough space for your components on the outer layers because of regulations from your mechanical build-up, for example, and you need to have an additional uh, inner layer equipped with um, embedded components. The second part is the performance or the function. Uh, you can by um, create your own integrated shielding by embedding a component and surrounding it with copper layers. But this can be a very good way to create your own Faraday cage uh, to shield your components. You can have short signal paths by looking into the third dimension when you place components directly underneath components, or you can secure your application and protect it against plagiarism by, for example, hiding components inside of the stack up, hide them underneath components or hide them underneath copper layers so that they are not optically visible anymore, but as well, for example, when you go into an X-ray system, that it's hard to find them in an X-ray as well. For sure, there are ways to find those components and to do a re-engineering, but the level uh, to do this is just increased a little bit more compared to a standard PCB. And the third point basically is the reliability. You can protect uh, components against environmental influences. If this is water or if this is oil or whatever this would be, you can protect them by putting FO4 around them. Uh, you can have a secure and full surface fixing. Um, what is meant with this? Well, basically when you look on a component and look on different uh, mechanical uh, stress events like a drop event or like vibrational events, um, the, the force path, how the, the mechanical stress is affecting the component is completely different because, yeah, it's it's completely surrounded by, by resin in our case so that the force acts on all surfaces of the component and not only through um, the connecting points like a, a solder connection or something like this. And the last point basically is the thermal management. This is, I would say, worldwide the second biggest trend because when you look on all these um, e-mobility and electrical cars, stuff like that, you have the, the ability to use embedding to get a very good heat management. Um, for example, we will later see a technology where you can directly contact and connect your component with copper so that you have a direct heat connection out of the component into the copper of the PCB. You can spread the heat very fast and you can get it very fast to the outer layers so that you have short heat paths and can spread it very fast. We will see this later, but this is basically the second biggest trend out there in the market. Which embedding technologies are we able to offer to you? So first of all, we have the so-called solder embedding technology. Here we use standard S&D components and solder them onto an inner layer core so that the electrical contact is done by the solder paste. We have a very high reliability here in that case. And since we can offer this now out of two fabs, we can offer you small, medium and large volumes with this technology. Then we have the so-called microwire embedding technology. Here we uh, use bare dies and uh, dedicated uh, resistors and capacitors. Dedicated means they have a special termination so that we can contact those components with microwires, as you can see in the cross section above. These components will be mounted onto inner layer cores or onto copper foils. We will see this later in the process flows. 
and are electrically contacted through microwires. We have a very high reliability here, the highest of all the technologies we can offer. Um, if you choose the right substrate material in combination with this technology, we get insane reliability results. There is one drawback in this technology. It's basically very um, yeah, drawn or shown into large volumes because of these dedicated um, surfaces which we need here. So it's not that easy to organize low volumes of components to get into this technology. And the third technology we offer is the so-called flip chip embedding. Here we use active components, bare dies only. Um, we mount them in a specific uh, flip chip process with the usage of an ACA glue. ACA stands for anisotropic conductive adhesive. Um, we can achieve high reliabilities here as well and offer this in small, medium and large volumes as well. So let's have a closer look onto the actual process flows. And we start with the microwire embedding. And actually, the microwire embedding, we have two, diff two different versions to do this. In version one, we take a copper foil, which has uh, some registration and fiducial marks on it already. And we assemble the components face down into a non-conductive epoxy adhesive. There will be no electrical collection, uh, connection in that stage yet. This is only a mechanical um, fixing of the components. Then we go to the multi-layer and in the layup, during the layup, um, we have um, our standard um, PCB materials and in the area of the components, they will be cut out either by punching or routing or lasering them so that we create some kind of cavities for the components so that in the first step of the multi-layer lamination, there won't be any mechanical stress on the components. We draw a vacuum so that the uh, air is taken out of the system and then we increase the temperature and the pressure. And by increasing the temperature and the pressure, the resin from the prepreg starts to flow again. It starts to flow around the components so that we completely fill up those cavities and that we have a built-up with no air inside. And then we go to our drilling um, processes, and especially the laser drilling is of interest here because we drill down through the copper, through the epoxy adhesive, onto the metal pads of the components, so that later in the electroplating process, we can contact the component directly with copper. There is a version two for this technology, in that case, we use a phased up assembly onto a pre-structured core, and we use either a non-conductive adhesive or we use um, a conductive adhesive, or what I didn't write here down here, we can do a soldering or a sintering of the component. So if we need a backside connection to the component, this would be possible here in that case. Version one could offer a backside connection as well, but here we could only use a microwire process as well. And that means that the backside of the component in version one would need a compatible a surface like copper, for example, as well, to make these microwires from the backside. Here we could use a standard backside metal like silver or something like this and connect it to the pre-structured core already. Then, as in version one, we go to the multi-layer, lay up, we create these cavities so that the components are not being destroyed in the first uh, part of the pressing process. Then we heat up the whole uh, system, we put pressure on it, and the resin starts to flow uh, around the components so that this is uh, being done during embedding. And again, we go to the laser process and we drill the microwires directly onto the copper pad or onto the pads of the components. And here you might see a little difference between version one and version two. So in version two, we have to take care about the height of the components because we are limited in a specific aspect ratio for the microbiomes. If we have different heights, this would mean we need to have different depths for the microbiomes as shown here in this picture. For the laser drilling, this might not be of an issue, but when we come to the electroplating, this will be an issue because in an aspect ratio, we are limited to one by one or one by 1.2, something like this. This means that uh, the different heights 
uh, well, actually are not different because we basically need almost the same height so that we can do a reliable microwire plating here. If we have different component heights, we would rather need to go to version one because there the difference in height doesn't affect the microwire because we drill through the epoxy glue and onto the pad where we have always the same depth of the component. And in version one, only the thickness of the component decides how thick the actual build up will be. So let's move on to the flip chip embedding. Well, basically, we use here in pre structured core as well. We use the bare die, but we need a bumped bare die here in that case. And we use this anisotropic conductive adhesive printed onto the inner layer core. And then we use a thermal compression process and press the component with its pads, with its bump onto the pads of the structured core. The glue will be hardened in that uh, assembly process instantly so that the component is electrically and mechanically fixed onto this core. The remaining steps basically are almost the same as for the other technologies. We go to the layup, we create this cavity, we put it into the pressing system, the resin starts to flow, it's being pressed into the cavity and starts to flow uh, around the component. And then we have the remaining PCB processes uh, like mechanical trading, outer layer structuring, solar resist, and so on to create the final PCB. The third process flow I want to show you is the solar process flow. And this is probably the one which you are most familiar with because the soldering which we are doing here is really comparable. And I would say like uh, the same as you would use it on an outer layer. So we use normally a standard uh, lead-free solder paste uh, to assemble the components onto a pre-structured inner layer core. And this inner layer core is only slightly modified compared to a standard inner layer core. This modification is basically two points. Uh, we have a very small a solar resist system introduced here, which means we only create a frame surrounding the solar pads so that this functionality of the solder mask is, uh, is kept so that the solder in the um, reflow process doesn't flow away and doesn't flow away onto the tracks and something like this. And therefore we need, and this is the second part of the modification, we need a solar surface. We have here a modified chemical tin surface and this is on the one hand our solar surface and in the second part, when we go to the lamination, this uh, modified chemical tin surface, which we use here on the inner layer core, acts as an adhesion promoter as well. So when we go to the layup, again, it's the same like on the other technologies, we create this cavity and then we increase the temperature and the pressure, we draw a vacuum and the resin is being pressed into this cavity, it flows around the components and we have the complete embedding of the components done by this. And the remaining steps basically are just the same as any other, any other PCB as well. We have the mechanical drillings, we have the outer layer structuring, so that we have the final PCB. And what I want to say here is that the stack ups I have shown now in this process flow, well, those are just to show you how this process is actually work. It doesn't mean that you have to use exactly these stack ups um these the, the stack ups you well can use are basically as individual as your application itself and therefore i want to show you some examples out of the product production here on the left side top left side you see a stack up for a, a, um, a, for a fed for a transistor and this is a combination of microwire embedding Plus, we have HDI, standard HDI microwires from the outer layers as well. Then here we have a combination of our rigid flex technology with microwire embedding. On the bottom left side, you see a very, well, it's a very easy application, actually. It's a flip chip embedded into FO4 material. We have only one layer in here. The purpose was just to secure um, the, the flip chip. Uh, with FO4 material uh, so that no mechanical force and no um, media, I have to take care of what I say now, um, so that nothing affects the component basically in a mechanical and in an environmental way. In the middle, you see a solder built up 
which we have combined again with uh, several microwire layers. These microwire layers could either be used for your fan out of the component to be soldered onto the inner layer core, but it can as well be used, for example, as a heat path. Um, you see that we could make, for example, the microwires directly into a ground pad of a component, for example, and then get the heat out of the component through the ground pad directly to the outside of the PCB by using two microwire, copper filled microwire layers as shown in this case here. And often there is the answer, am I able to use more than one layer assembled with components? Basically, yes, you can do this. The question is uh, always, do we need to do this? Because yeah, for sure this adds in cost. Uh, the only thing what we cannot do at the moment is we cannot assemble an inner layer core uh, with front and back side components. We just can assemble components on one side of the inner layer core. This is due to the fact, you will see this later, that we have to assemble often very thin cores. And these thin cores are hard to handle. <clears throat> and so they would be, it would be even harder to handle them in a double layer assembly. Therefore, we can only offer at the moment a single sided assembly for the inner layer cores. So you see the stack ups, well, they really are as individual as your application and therefore they are again generated based on your needs and your requirements in the application. Um, you've seen the assembly processes are yeah, sometimes very special and therefore we were asked or we had, we were standing before the decision, do we invest into an own assembly line or do we build up a partner to do this for us? And I have to say that we do not have, and it is not planned anymore to have an in-house assembly line at Wood Electronic, because there are partners out there which are doing this quite good. We have a fully qualified and audited partner in use, and you see a picture of his assembly lines here, and he is capable to do this in a very good way. And we are building up a second source partner right at the moment, so that in future we even have two partners to choose from um, depending on your needs and depending on the requirements and so on. Why is this of an interesting point? Because we have quite interesting challenges here to do this. So first of all, I already said that we are offering this in two manufacturing plants now. And those two manufacturing plants, they have specific assembly formats. So basically these are the formats in which our PCBs are being manufactured in general. So since we are not doing a, a smaller size here, even in our prototype plant, we need to assemble 460 by 305 millimeters. And in our series plant in Needon Hall, we have to double this size, which means we have 610 by 460 millimeter as assembly format. This is quite big. And I would say like more than 90% of the assembly lines in, in Europe are basically not capable to do this, especially when it comes to the point that we have very thin built-ups. So for the microwire technology, we might come to the point that we might want to assemble a 70 micron thick copper foil. The 70 micron, actually, this is not the, the actual copper layer which you would use in your application later on. This is more like a five or nine micron thick copper layer with, uh, for example, 60 or 65 micron thick or 70 micron thick uh, carrier. But overall, it's 70 to, to 80 micron thick, and this is really flexible. And this, um, in combination with the size, this is yeah quite, quite interesting to do so in an assembly line. Therefore, we, it took us quite a few, <clears throat> yeah, almost more than two years to get our first partner. And it took us even longer to find a second partner who can fulfill everything what we need here uh, in his assembly line so that we can assemble inner layer cores in the required configuration. You see such an inner layer core on the top right picture. Um, this is an inner layer core already assembled with resistors and components here in that application. And you see that we do not take small PCBs and uh, put them into an array and try to um, create an, an, a bigger array out of it. We really assemble the full um, manufacturing panel. And this is what it makes it difficult for a lot of assembly partners so that we are very lucky and happy to have these 
two partners now which we want to use in future. To do this, we had to create our own logistics concept, so how to, to pack those panels, send them to the partner, and how he can pack them and send them back to us so that nothing is being um, destroyed here, that we do not have any scratches and stuff like this. What I have to say as well is we fully qualified, uh, qualified and audited the first partner already, and as I said, the second partner is currently being built up so in this in qualification. So now you might want to ask the question, which technology should I use? And yeah, mostly this is a very easy answer um, to give because in 95% of the use cases we have here, this is being decided by the application or the components you want to use. Why that? Because yeah, the question always is in which form the components are available. So are these already SMB components? Well, then you probably might want to use the solar embedding process. Do you have the bare dyes, which can be connected with copper or have a specific requirement like a very good heat path, something like this? You might want to use microwire embedding. And if you have bare dyes with gold bumps, well, it's, it's a flip chip embedding. If you have an existing technology, for example, you have the SMD components, but still want to use the microwire embedding, embedding well, then the question occurs, are you able to source the component in a different configuration or are you able to get the component built in a different configuration so that, for example, instead of aluminum on the pads, which are normally being used, for example, as a wire bonding uh, pad, um, are you able to get the component, for example, with a copper pad so that we can make a microwire on it? This is something you have to ask yourself or have to ask your a component manufacturer. There are ways, for example, to modify a component. If you have it with aluminum, there are subcontractors who might, uh, who are able to, for example, put copper onto the component as well. But this is something we will have to talk about when it really comes to the application then. Sometimes it might be the case that, for example, you get one component for one technology and the other component in the other technology. Or you want to have, for example, because you need it, Due to uh, thermal management reasons, you want to embed a component with microwires and connect it with microwires, but the other components are not available uh, for the microwire technology, then you might want to uh, mix the technologies. This is doable, uh, but as always in life, this creates cost. And the question is, do we need to do it? Do you want to do it? Um, this needs to be decided for the application. Which components are you able to use? And here I have a small chart for the soldering of the components onto the inner layer as well. In principle, each solid SMD component is uh, possible to use as long, well, as long as the maximum thickness of the component um, is not thicker uh, than the layer stack. It's not possible, for example, to use a 3.2 millimeter capacitor and embed it into 1.6 millimeter built up. No component is allowed to stick outside of the PCB, so it needs to fit into the stack up. And there are some other um, no-gos, I would call them. If you have any kind of liquids or electrolytes, liquid electrolytes in your component, this will give you issues. Maybe we could build the PCB, but if you go, for example, to an additional uh, temperature step like soldering, you might run into the risk that, well, you might have the classical popcorn effect. The liquid inside the component starts to boil, you get a vapor and a vapor pressure, and this vapor pressure, well, basically, uh, your PCB explodes like a popcorn. Another thing is air inclusions or air cavities inside of the components. This is critical as well because um, during lamination, in the first point or in the first step, there is no mechanical stress onto the component because the component sits inside this cavity, as I've shown in the previous slides. But in that case, when the resin completely uh, was flowing around the component, there will be some kind of pressure onto the component as well. So and if you have an, an, a cavity inside the component, for example, like a quartz crystal with a metal lid, this pressure might yeah, bend this metal lid to the inside 
and either the functionality of the component is not that as you're used to or it will be completely destroyed so we have we'll have to take a look onto this there are some other points we have to look at for example um, components with ferrites ferrites are very brittle this might be an issue or some glass based components like melts this might be of an issue as well so we will have to look on these components during the process and during the stack up planning we will see this later how we do this from a microwire embedding point of view and from a flip chip point embedding um, we are using either a component with uh, specific pet metallizations like copper or nickel palladium for the active components or with copper terminations from a passive point of view. Um, there are several uh, vendors out there uh, who offer resistors and cap capacitors with these copper terminations. And as I already said, if you have an, a bare die, which previously was meant for uh, wire bonding, for example, there might be subcontractors out there who can do, like you see here in this uh, microscope picture, a so-called RDL, a redistribution layer with copper, so that you have a copper surface with big enough pads which can be contacted by microwires. For the flip chip process, we are using in our process, we always need gold bumps. And these gold bumps are either being done on a waiver level process already by the manufacturer, by the semiconductor manufacturer, um, by plating those gold bumps. And this is often the case, for example, when you want to use RFID or NFC dies, they are often already uh, delivered in this configuration. Or if you have a standard wire bond chip, we can go to our in-house wire bond process and in the ball wedge process, we can place a ball onto the pad and rip off the wire. And then you have a, a gold bump uh, as well onto the pad. And then we can use our ACA uh, flip chip process and place it onto an inner layer core. So which design rules um, should you use? I do not want to go into the details because we already have quite a lot of information on our website, for example. We have this design guide for embedding technology. Um, what I want to say is that please bear in mind that depending on the PCB configuration, if this is a combination of embedding with HDI or flex rigid, you need to have a look onto these design guides as well and find a combination in technologies for the design guides. Um, you will get these design guides for sure from your trusted manufacturer. Hopefully, we will be the trusted manufacturer for this technology and for the other technologies as well. But there are things which are not yet present in our design guides. So therefore, uh, you will be the ones who will see these additional points in this presentation. So one question often occurs is the maximum thickness of the PCB. Well, this is basically according to a general PCB specification. Our default thickness is 2.4 millimeters. And upon request, we can manufacture PCB bolts up to 3.2 millimeters. Well, this 3.2 millimeter basically is almost like a standard already. Um, but where it's getting critical, if you need to have bolts thicker than 3.2 millimeter, now we have to look onto the processes, what is needed. Um, if we can make thicker bolts, this is something we have to, to uh, have a closer look on. The layer stack up. Well, at least one layer of prepack should always be inserted between the component and the copper layer above. This is due to isolation requirements so that the component is not directly being in contact if something happens during lamination with the copper layer above. And based on the assembly technology and the layer stack, well, the maximum thickness of the components can be calculated um, you will see later that you will get a stack-up proposal from us. And in this stack-up proposal, you either see uh, the already maximum component height, and we calculate the stack-up height out of the maximum component height, or vice versa. Uh, you give us a, a stack-up, a maximum thickness of the stack-up, and based on the stack-up and the maximum thickness of the stack-up, we calculate backwards and give you an impression of how thick might the thickest component in the stack up be so that everything fits inside of this stack up and as i already said well all the components need to fit into the stack up and there is no component allowed to stick or protrude outside of the pcb in the set axis 
Then there is one point about uh, inner layer occupancy. So how many components can you fit onto the inner layer? Well, um, normally we say, please, not more than 40% of the available area. Why that? Well, you've seen in the process flows that we need to fit FO4 material beside the components so that resin can flow into the cavity. And if there are more than 40% of components uh, assembled on the area, we might run into the issue that we do not have enough resin out of the prepregs so that we cannot embed the components reliable anymore. We might have uh, air inclusions, voids, something like this, and we want and need to avoid the voids. If you have more than 40% and a need for more than 40%, we need to take a closer look onto this. We need to make a very thorough calculation for the resin regime. And maybe we need to add additional processes like, for example, we need to go into an underfill process so that we uh, underfill the components and the resin is not needed for the underfill anymore. So this is something which could be done, but we need to take a closer look onto this. Then components should be grouped. Why that? Well, again, it's the same thing. Uh, we need to find enough space for FO4 materials surrounding components. And you see here in that example that on the left side, uh, this was the placement of the components. On the right side, you see the, the routing program for the prepreg so that we can create this cavity. And in between those uh, groups, we need to find enough space for resin. And this is why we have this distance uh, rule that between the groups or between a group and a component, we would like to have at least one millimeter of space. This could be uh, decreased to seven millimeter upon request, but we need to have a closer look then and see if there is still enough resin uh, in between the groups so that this might work. When we look on the next point, this is uh, which distance uh, can we have or how close can I place the component to the PCB outline? Well, here we say it should be at least 500 microns or more. Less could be possible upon request, but why are we saying 500 microns? Well, actually this comes from the point that when we do this cavities, there is a distance between the component and the cavity wall where we only fill up the whole wall or the whole air cavity with resin. And we would like to have uh, at least a, a few, two to 300 microns of glass cloth from the prepreg to the outline so that we have a secure fixing on the outline as well, that nothing breaks out from a cavity, for example, if it's only being filled with resin. That's the same with the distance of the wire to the components. So first, for sure, we need to take care during the planning that no wire is being drilled through a component. And you might, you might laugh now, but this actually already has happened in the beginning when we started with the technology that we did everything which we could, but there was one wire which we just didn't see even during design rule check. And now we say the distance of, from a wire to a component should be at least 500 microns. And during the layout, and you will see this in the second part of my uh, presentation when we talk about the layout, how we can prevent this, that a component runs through a component. But here we say at least please 500 micron away from a component, less could be possible as well again, but then we need to have a closer look onto it. And the distance from component to component, well, here we have two points. The first point basically is we look on the footprint and if the footprint extends the outline of the component, then we look on the distance between the pads. And this should be uh, in our favorite way, should be 300 microns uh, so that we get, for example, in the solar technology, um, still a solar bridge between the pads, or when we look on the microwire technology, that the, um, that the glue fillet is not touching the glue fillet of the other component. This might get to assembly issues if the, the, the glue dots and the, the, the printed glue flow together, and therefore we need to have at least 300 microns. <clears throat> if the component is bigger than the actual footprint, for example, for bottom termination components, then we say at least 200 micron between the component outlines. And as always, smaller distance might be uh, possible, but then we again need to have a closer look onto it. And this is an example of a, of a very tightly packed component group. You see here that the distances, um, to give you an imagination what components are being used, we have uh, 04, 02, and 02, 01 components here on this picture. So 
these components are O2 or one. And especially in these active components here, you see this is less than 200 microns. And therefore, uh, this works, but we need to have a closer look. So the solar frame here, for example, this is a 100 micron wide frame. And you see that these components, uh, this is 100 or 150 micron distance. So it's less than in our design rules. So it's possible, but we will have to look onto it in a more detailed way. So this is where we come to the second question I want to ask you. Which of the three technologies I presented is or are of interest to you? So you have a multiple choice question. And please, Andreas, show the poll. OK, so you could answer now or make your choice. We have already more than 50% answers from you. So I will wait another, let's say, five or 10 seconds. Then we will close the poll and have a look at the answers. OK, so let's close and show. So solder, around about half of you are interested in that. Embedding based on micro bias, around about a third of you. And uh, flip chip is around about, yeah, nearly 20%. Thank you very much. So thank you for these answers. And it quite, it actually quite fits into our production when I look into the running applications and projects. The solar embedding is the one used most as well for us. Um, but there are other applications as well where the other components uh, and other technologies are used as well. And uh, in the second part of our webinar beginning next year, you will see such applications and how they are being done and what they are used for. So let's come to the last part of today's webinar. We will have a look onto the workflow for an embedding project. And I would say in most of the cases, we normally start with the bill of materials because as i said the components decide which technologies may be used and to do a good planning we would like to have an additional i would say a bomb plus from you because we want to have a mechanical information as well please insert in your bomb the maximum dimensions in x y and z so we need all three dimensions because then we can do a stack up planning to see if the components fit into the stack up and so on. We can do uh, a volume planning based on this, uh, for example, to, to do the calculation if we still have enough resin in the system to fill up the cavity completely. And this is why we need those um, additional mechanical parts in the bomb already. When we receive the bomb from you, well, we do, we analyze it and look for the embeddability. Interesting world. So we, we want to take a look if the components can be used, basically. And you see here, this is just out of a, a customer bomb. What we did here, yeah, you see in the last uh, column, you see the maximum height. And there are components which are quite thick. So for example, IC1 is just too thick with its 3.6 millimeters. So we marked it red. And either it's being placed on the outer layer, or we find an additional or um, package and another package form, which can be used here, uh, so that this component might be used for embedding. But in the first point, we have to say, no, IC1 does not work. You see the green mic components, they are not an issue for the desired stack up our customer wanted to have. And you see this um, yellow or orange marked uh, rows. These rows indicate that it probably would work, um, but they are on the on the uh, upper limit so that during later in the phase we might want to change it a little bit in the thicknesses and so on but they are they tend to to work and they tend to the green part then we would like to have the data from the inner layer assembly uh, for example an assembly drawing so that we see what you planned and based on your plannings we can do for example an occupancy drawing because we need additional uh, information, for example, for the contacts, 
protruding the body like gull wings or jay leads as well because we need to create the cutouts not only for the body but for the contacts as well and then we can do this occupancy uh, planning if we still have enough resin in the system then uh, we would like to have already some kind of data set for the remaining layers for uh, at least uh, or preferably extended Gerber's or ODB++ plus plus and documents where we can see the PCB outline which you want to have or maybe even the outline of the assembly array if you need one, um, uh, the layout data if already available, the required number of layers, is it a four, six, eight or only one layer built up, the required copper thicknesses especially when it comes to, to heat management, do we need 35, 70, 105 or even more uh, thickness in copper? Do we have some uh, special via connections or layer connections, layer one to layer three in a six layer build up or something like this? Um, do we have some predefined layer distances due to, for example, impedance requirements or some insulation requirements? For example, I need to have a one millimeter FO4 between layer three and four because uh, there is two kilovolts of uh, uh, voltage uh, running over the tra uh, between the tracks and the layers or something like this. And I know that often the, there is no full layout data. So either you can send us uh, what you already have. Maybe sometimes it's often a placement plan and some, some ideas. Or it often helps if you already have a previous board for the same application where you might want to shrink it, for example. And often this data from this previous board is often helpful as well because there can be a lot of things already taken out of the previous board so that we know what we need to change when it comes to the embedding. So after reviewing and checking all the data, including the components and departments on, we are creating a layer stack up for you where we try to um, fit all the requirements like layer distances, wire configurations, and you will see on which layer the component can be placed. And like in this example here, if for example, components are that thick, that maybe we need to have a cutout core here in that case as well, something like this. And based on this stack up and uh, based on the components we agreed on to be embedded, uh, the layout phase basically can start for your application. And this is where we come to the end of this today's webinar. And in the second part of the embedding webinar, which is at the moment being planned for March 16th in 2021, well, we seamlessly will continue with this topic layout. So you will see um, how to lay out printed circuit boards with embedded components if you not already have done it. And we have seen there are quite some uh, people joining the webinar who didn't get in contact yet with this kind of technology. I will show you what today's EDA tools are already capable of in this technology. I will show you how to create the libraries when we uh, add components to be embedded. And I will want to show you some tricks and knacks for uh, the layout with embedding technology. And as well, in the second part of the webinar, you will gain an insight into current applications and projects already running in our fabs. From, for example, from an automotive point of view, industrial applications, uh, medical applications, as well as aerospace and sensor applications. And in the end of the second webinar, I want to give you some further application ideas so that you get the whole impression of what you can do with embedding technology. So in the end, I want to say thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining today's webinar. I hope that I could give you a first insight into the basics, that you get the idea how to do it. And I would like to welcome you in the second part of this webinar. And with this, I would like to hand over to Andreas again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.